11, May 1975. For Todd, that Friday was the longest of his life. He sat in class after class, hearing nothing, waiting only for the last five minutes when the instructor would take out his or her small pile of flunk cards and distribute them. Each time an instructor approached Todd's desk with that pile of cards, he grew cold. Each time he or she passed him without stopping, he felt waves of dizziness and semi-hysteria. Algebra was the worst. Storman approached, hesitated, and just as Todd became convinced he was going to pass on, he laid a flunk card face down on Todd's desk. Todd looked at it coldly with no feelings at all. Now that it had happened, he was only cold. Well, that's it, he thought. Point, game, set, and match. Unless Dusander can think of something else, and I have my doubts. Without much interest, he turned the flunk card over to see by how much he had missed his C. It must have been close, but trust old stony Storman not to give anyone a break. He saw that the grade spaces were utterly blank, both the letter grade space and the numerical grade space. Written in the comments section was this message, I'm sure glad I don't have to give you one of these for real, Charles Storman. The dizziness came again more savagely this time, roaring through his head, making it feel like a balloon filled with helium. He gripped the sides of his desk as hard as he could, holding one thought with total obsessive tightness. You will not faint, not faint, not faint. Little by little the waves of dizziness passed, and then he had to control an urge to run up the aisle after Storm and turn him around and poke his eyes out with the freshly sharpened pencil he held in his hand. And through it all, his face remained carefully blank. The only sign that anything at all was going on inside was a mild tick in one eyelid. School let out for the week fifteen minutes later. Todd walked slowly around the building to the bike racks, his head down, his hands shoved into his pockets, his books tucked into the crook of his right arm, oblivious of the running, shouting students. He tossed the books into his bike basket, unlocked the Schwinn, and pedaled away toward Dusander's house. Today, he thought, today is your day, old man. And so, Dusander said, pouring bourbon into his cup as Todd entered the kitchen, the accused returns from the dock. How said they, prisoner? He was wearing his bathrobe and a pair of hairy wool socks that climbed halfway up his shins. Socks like that Todd thought would be easy to slip in. He glanced at the bottle of ancient age Dusander was currently working. It was down to the last three fingers. No D's, no F's, no flunk cards, Todd said. I'll still have to change some of my grades in June, but maybe just the averages. I'll be getting all A's and B's this quarter if I keep up my work. Oh, you'll keep it up all right, Dusander said. We will see to it. He drank and then tipped more bourbon into his cup. This calls for a celebration. His speech was slightly blurred, hardly enough to be noticeable, but Todd knew the old fuck was as drunk as he ever got. Yes, today. It would have to be today. But he was cool. Celebrate pig shit, he told Dusander. I'm afraid the delivery boy hasn't arrived with the beluga and the truffles yet, Dusander said, ignoring him. Help is so unreliable these days. What about a few Ritz crackers and some Velveeta while we wait? Okay, Todd said. What the hell? Dusander stood up, one knee banged the table, making him wince, and crossed to the refrigerator. He got out the cheese, took a knife from the drawer and a plate from the cupboard, and a box of Ritz crackers from the bread box. All carefully injected with prussic acid, he told Todd as he set the cheese and crackers down on the table. He grinned, and Todd saw that he had left out his false teeth again today. Nevertheless, Todd smiled back. So quiet today, Dusander exclaimed. I would have expected you to turn handsprings all the way up the hall. He emptied the last of the bourbon into his cup, sipped, smacked his lips. I guess I'm still numb, Todd said. He bit into a cracker. He had stopped refusing Dusander's food a long time ago. Dusander thought there was a letter with one of Todd's friends. There was not, of course. He had friends, but none he trusted that much. He supposed Dusander had guessed that long ago. 
But he knew Dusander didn't quite dare put his guest to such an extreme test as murder. What shall we talk about today? Dusander inquired, tossing off the last shot. I give you the day off from studying. How's that, huh? Huh? When he drank, his accent became thicker. It was an accent Todd had come to hate. Now he felt okay about the accent. He felt okay about everything. He felt very cool all over. He looked at his hands, the hands which would give the push, and they looked just as they always did. They were not trembling. They were cool. I don't care, he said, anything you want. Shall I tell you about the special soap we made? Our experiments with enforced homosexuality. Or perhaps you would like to hear how I escaped to Berlin after I had been foolish enough to go back. That was a close one, I can tell you. He pantomimed, shaving one stubby cheek and laughed. Anything, Todd said, really. He watched Dusander examine the empty bottle and then get up with it in one hand. Dusander took it to the wastebasket and dropped it in. No, none of those, I think, Dusander said. You don't seem to be in the mood. He stood reflectively by the wastebasket for a moment and then crossed the kitchen to the cellar door. His wool socks whispered on the hilly linoleum. I think today I will instead tell you the story of an old man who was afraid. Dusander opened the cellar door. His back was now to the table. Todd stood up quietly. He was afraid, Dusander went on, of a certain young boy who was in a queer way his friend. A smart boy. His mother called this boy apt pupil. And the old man had already discovered he was an apt pupil, although perhaps not in the way his mother thought. Dusander fumbled with the old-fashioned electrical switch on the wall, trying to turn it with his bunched and clumsy fingers. Todd walked, almost glided across the linoleum, not stepping on any of the places where it squeaked or creaked. He knew this kitchen as well as his own now, maybe better. At first, the boy was not the old man's friend. Dusanta said. He managed to turn the switch at last. He descended the first step with a veteran drunk's care. At first, the old man disliked the boy a great deal. Then he grew to, to enjoy his company, although there was still a strong element of dislike there. He was looking at the shelf now, but still holding the railing. Todd, cool, no, now he was cold, stepped behind him and calculated the chances of one strong push dislodging Dusander's hold on the railing. He decided to wait until Dusander leaned forward. Part of the old man's enjoyment came from a feeling of equality, Dusander went on thoughtfully. You see, the boy and the old man had each other in mutual death grips. Each knew something the other wanted kept secret. And then, ah, then it became apparent to the old man that things were changing. Yes, he was losing his hold. Some of it, or all of it, depending on how desperate the boy might be and how clever. It occurred to this old man on one long and sleepless night that it might be well for him to acquire a new hold on the boy for his own safety. Now Dusander let go of the railing and leaned out over the steep cellar stairs, but Todd remained perfectly still. The bone-deep cold was melting out of him, being replaced by a rosy flush of anger and confusion. As Dusander grasped his fresh bottle, Todd thought viciously that the old man had the stinkiest cellar in town, oil or no oil. It smelled as if something had died down there. So the old man got out of his bed right then, with his sleep to an old man very little. And he sat at his small desk, thinking about how cleverly he had enmeshed the boy in the very crimes the boy was holding over his own head. He sat, thinking about how hard the boy had worked, how very hard to bring his school marks back up, and how, when they were back up, he would have no further need for the old man alive. And if the old man were dead, the boy could be free. He turned around now, holding the fresh bottle of ancient age by the neck, I heard you, you know, he said almost gently. From the moment you pushed your chair back and stood up, you are not as quiet as you imagine, boy. 
At least not yet. Todd said nothing. So, Dusanda exclaimed, stepping back into the kitchen and closing the cellar door firmly behind him. The old man wrote everything down, nicht wahr? From first word to last he wrote it down. When he was finally finished, it was almost dawn, and his hand was singing from the arthritis, the verdumped arthritis, but he felt good for the first time in weeks. He felt safe. He got back into his bed and slept until mid-afternoon. In fact, if he had slept any longer, he would have missed his favorite, General Hospital. He had regained his rocker now. He sat down, produced a worn jackknife with a yellow ivory handle, and began to cut painstakingly around the seal covering the top of the bourbon bottle. On the following day, the old man dressed in his best suit and went down to the bank, where he kept his little checking and savings accounts. He spoke to one of the bank officers who was able to answer all the old man's questions most satisfactorily. He rented a safety deposit box. The bank officer explained to the old man that he would have a key, and the bank would have a key. To open the box, both keys would be needed. No one but the old man could use the old man's key without a signed, notarized letter of permission from the old man himself, with one exception. Dusander smiled toothlessly into Todd Bowden's white, set face. That exception is made in the event of the box holder's death, he said. Still looking at Todd, still smiling, Dusander put his jackknife back into the pocket of his robe, unscrewed the cap of the bourbon bottle, and poured a fresh jolt into his cup. What happens then? Todd asked hoarsely. Then the box is opened in the presence of a bank official and a representative of the Internal Revenue Service. The contents of the box are inventoried. In this case, they will find only a twelve-page document, non-taxable, but highly interesting. The fingers of Todd's hands crept toward each other and locked tightly. You can't do that, he said in a stunned and unbelieving voice. It was the voice of a person who observes another person walking on the ceiling. You can't, can't do that, my boy, Dusander said kindly. I have, but... I, you, his voice suddenly rose to an agonized howl. You're old. Don't you know that you're old? You could die. You could die any time. Dusander got up. He went to one of the kitchen cabinets and took down a small glass. This glass had once held jelly. Cartoon characters danced around the rim. Todd recognized them all. Fred and Wilma Flintstone, Barney and Betty Rubble, Pebbles and Bam Bam. He had grown up with them. He watched as Dusander wiped this jelly glass almost ceremonially with a dish towel. He watched as Dusander set it in front of him. He watched as Dusander poured a finger of bourbon into it. What's that for? Todd muttered. I don't drink. Drinking for cheap stew bums like you. Lift your glass, boy. It is a special occasion. Today you drink. Todd looked at him for a long moment, then picked up the glass. Dusander clicked his cheap ceramic cup smartly against it. I make a toast, boy. Long life. Long life to both of us. Prosit. He tossed his bourbon off at a gulp and then began to laugh. He rocked back and forth, stockinged feet hitting the linoleum, laughing, and Todd thought he had never looked so much like a vulture, a vulture in a bathrobe, a noisome beast of carrion. I hate you, he whispered. And then Dusander began to choke on his own laughter. His face turned a dull brick color. It sounded as if he were coughing, laughing, and strangling all at the same time. Todd, scared, got up quickly and clapped him on the back until the coughing fit had passed. Danke schön, he said. Drink your drink, it will do you good. Todd drank it. It tasted like very bad cold medicine and lit a fire in his gut. I can't believe you drink this shit all day, he said, putting the glass back on the table and shuddering. You ought to quit it. Quit drinking and smoking. Your concern for my health is touching, Dusander said. He produced a crumpled pack of cigarettes from the same bathrobe pocket into which the jackknife had disappeared. And I am equally solicitous of your own welfare, boy. Almost every day I read in the paper where a cyclist has been killed at a busy intersection. You should give it up. You should walk. Or ride the bus like me. Why don't you go fuck yourself, Todd burst out. 
My boy, Dusander said, pouring more bourbon and beginning to laugh again. We are fucking each other, didn't you know that? One day, about a week later, Todd was sitting on a disused mail platform down in the old train yard. He chucked cinders out across the rusty, weed-infested tracks one at a time. Why shouldn't I kill him anyway? Because he was a logical boy, the logical answer came first. No reason at all. Sooner or later, Dusander was going to die, and given Dusander's habits, it would probably be sooner. Whether he killed the old man, or whether Dusander died of a heart attack in his bathtub, it was all going to come out. At least he could have the pleasure of wringing the old vulture's neck. Sooner or later, that phrase defied logic. Maybe it'll be later, Todd thought. Cigarettes or not, booze or not, he's a tough old bastard. He's lasted this long, so... So maybe it'll be later. From beneath him came a fuzzy snort. Todd jumped to his feet, dropping a handful of cinders he had been holding. That snorting sound came again. He paused on the verge of running, but the snort didn't recur. Nine hundred yards away, an eight-lane freeway swept across the horizon above this weed and junk-strewn cul-de-sac with its deserted buildings, rusty cyclone fences, and splintery warped platforms. The cars up on the freeway glistened in the sun like exotic hard-shelled beetles. Eight lanes of traffic up there. Nothing down here but Todd, a few birds, and whatever had snorted. Cautiously, he bent down with his hands on his knees and peered under the mail platform. There was a wino lying up in there among the yellow weeds and empty cans and dusty old bottles. It was impossible to tell his age. Todd put him at somewhere between thirty and four hundred. He was wearing a strappy T-shirt that was caked with dried vomit, green pants that were far too big for him, and gray leather work shoes cracked in a hundred places. The cracks gaped like agonized mouths. Todd thought he smelled like Dusander's cellar. The wino's red-laced eyes opened slowly and stared at Todd with a bleary lack of wonder. As they did, Todd thought of the Swiss army knife in his pocket, the angler model. He had purchased it at a sporting goods store in Redondo Beach almost a year ago. He could hear the clerk that had waited on him in his mind. You couldn't pick a better knife than that one, son. Knife like that could save your life some day. We sell fifteen hundred Swiss knives every damn year. Fifteen hundred a year. He put his hand in his pocket and gripped the knife. In his mind's eye, he saw Dusander's jackknife working slowly around the neck of the bourbon bottle, slitting the seal. A moment later, he became aware that he had an erection. Cold terror stole into him. The wino swiped a hand over his cracked lips and then licked them with a tongue which nicotine had turned a permanent, dismal yellow. Got a dime, kid? Todd looked at him expressionlessly. Gotta get to L.A. I need another dime for the bus. I got appointment, me. I got a job opportunity. A nice kid like you must have a dime? Maybe you got a quarter. Yes, sir, you could clean out a damn bluegill with a knife like that. Hell, you could clean out a damn marlin with it if you had to. We sell 1,500 of those a year. Every sporting goods store and Army-Navy surplus in America sells them. And if you decided to use this one to clean out some dirty, shitty old wino, nobody could trace it back to you. Absolutely nobody. The wino's voice dropped. It became a confidential, tenebrous whisper. For a buck, I do you a blowjob. You never had it better. You'd gum your brains out, kid. You'd... Todd pulled his hand out of his pocket. He wasn't sure what was in it until he opened it. Two quarters, two nickels, a dime, some pennies. He threw them at the wino and fled.